A transgender woman identified as Julie Doe disappeared in 1988 from Claremont, Florida. Neither the victims nor the killer's identities have been determined at this time. Until DNA testing in 2015, it was assumed that the victim was a cisgender woman. In this video, I will be talking about the Julie Doe case, but before we start, I would like you to give this video a like and subscribe to this channel. On September 25, 1988, the victim's mummified bones were discovered by a roadside in the Green Swamp area of Claremont, Lake County, Florida. The victim was between the ages of 22 and 35. A man on the lookout for timber uncovered the area first. The body was taken to a secret location not far from the county line between Lake and Polk. She was dressed in an acid-washed denim miniskirt and a tank top with a bluish-green hue. It appeared that she had been sexually assaulted because her pantyhose was torn. There were no identifying items, shoes, jewelry, or other personal effects located at the scene. Her body was found in a peculiar location, leading investigators to suspect homicide. The University of Florida's Department of Anthropology, which includes the C.A. Pound Human Identification Laboratory, Cap Hill, received Jane Doe's nearly skeletal remains. Dr. William Maples, a renowned forensic anthropologist, conducted an autopsy there. Dr. Maples was analyzing the remains of Spanish explorer Francisco Pizarro and the elephant man, Joseph Merrick, at the time she was discovered. The finest possible care was taken for Jane Doe's remains while they were being examined. Based on her height and weight, Dr. Maples estimated that the woman was between 24 and 32 years old and around 5 feet 10 inches tall. According to Dr. Maples, she would have looked normal and proportionate with 250 cc silicone breast implants, given her height and build. Her pelvic bones had various depressions and ridges that he attributed at the time to the effects of pregnancy hormones that loosened the pelvis in anticipation of birthing. Using the state of the art at the time, Dr. Maples concluded that the deceased woman had given birth multiple times. There was no way to confirm how Jane Doe died, but foul play is still suspected. After Detective Tamara Dale of the Lake County Sheriff's Department took over the investigation, she made sure it was included in a statewide initiative to solve cold cases by employing cutting-edge technology. In 2015, she was found to be a transsexual woman after one of these tests revealed that she possessed XY chromosomes. When Dr. Michael Warren, director of Cap Hill and a former student of Dr. Maples, re-examined the remains, he realized that his teacher had made some reasonable errors in light of the scientific knowledge available at the time. Dr. Maples' findings that she had pitted on her pelvis due to hormones can now be explained by her use of hormone replacement medication during gender transition. This transgender woman was given her new name and a second artistic reconstruction when it became public that she was transitioning. Forensic students researching her skeleton came up with the name Julie for her. Detective Stephen Fusco of the Orange County Sheriff's Department, who is also a forensic artist, did her second artistic reconstruction. Mr. Fusco, who is now retired, claims that he has no recollection of this specific case. His illustrations are consistently praised for their exceptional quality, and Julie's sketch was no exception. The first autopsy looked into the woman's life and attempted to determine the reason for her untimely demise. The medical examiner described the victim as a Caucasian female between the ages of 22 and 35, who was at least 5 feet 10 inches tall. She was physically fit and had a trim athletic figure at the time of her death, suggesting she may have been an athlete. There were no recent symptoms of major physical trauma on the woman's body, but there were no internal or visible signs of trauma either. Thus, a cause of death could never be confirmed. After some time, the breaks in Julie Doe's ribs, nose, cheekbones, and toe all healed. The fracture in the cheekbone was most obviously caused by blunt force trauma. There is no way to determine if all of these wounds occurred at once or on separate occasions. Although there is a plethora of contradictory data, a 250cc implant is a safe and common choice, and a 200cc implant is roughly equivalent to a one-cup size increase. Because of the lot number on her breast implant, investigators were able to narrow down the possible year of her surgery to 1984. Unfortunately, it wasn't until the 1990s that all implants were given serial numbers, so, so that wouldn't give them any clues as to who she was. 
A Jane Doe who had breast implants today can be identified by serial number, but in 1988, this wasn't possible. One of the most intriguing findings from the initial autopsy concerned the victim's pelvis. He claimed that she had already given birth once. Her pelvis showed signs of parturition, which were commonly linked with natural childbirth at the time. These depressions can happen during a vaginal birth if the ligaments are torn, or if the ligaments are loosened too much. Studies have shown that women who have given birth are statistically more likely to have these pits and that the depth of the pits increases with the number of children a woman has. In contrast, no one who has given birth in any of the trials has shown any evidence of a parturition scar. Most osteologists have drawn the conclusion that this pitting is more indicative of female puberty and hormones than of natural birth. The first inquiry into Julie Doe's death relied solely on the results of this autopsy, as no other information or evidence was available at the time. The case of Jane Doe swiftly grew cold due to the lack of leads. This was in part due to a lack of information and leads, but in 2015 the police department realized that they had overlooked a crucial portion of the case during their initial investigation. One of the most intriguing and crucial features of this case is the time frame of Julie's change. The fact that she was able to get so much done suggests that she was well off enough to afford several surgeries and that she had friends and family to assist her recovery and locate specialists willing to treat her. These are extremely unusual occurrences given the time period in which Julie was born and raised. Julie would have needed to be on hormone replacement medication for a long time prior to her death for the initial medical examiner to have mistaken her bone structure for that of a biological female. She would have needed to be on hormo hormones for at least two years prior to getting breast implants as a trans woman. Since the cutoff year for this particular brand of breast implants was 1984, it's safe to assume that she passed away at least six years after passing as a woman. She may have been as young as 16 when this process began, according to the lowest age estimate. Her pelvic pitting was so obvious, and her skeleton did not resemble that of a man going through puberty because she started HRT at such a young age. Given this, it's likely that she began taking hormones before she was in her mid-twenties. The DNA Doe Project announced in 2018 that they would try to trace Julie Doe's genetic ancestry. Donate's testing and research fund was fully financed in just two days, making it one of the shortest DDP campaigns to date. Things didn't continue to go swimmingly from there. It took three tries to get a good enough DNA profile from Julie Doe's bones to use in genetic genealogy. All along, there was concern that the DDP might give up, or that the technique, which has been so effective in other situations, would fail to help Julie. Finally, her DNA was taken and submitted to GEDmatch. Julie Doe's DNA revealed that she has ancestors from the southeast of the United States. The isotope analysis confirmed that she originated from the southern part of Florida, so this makes sense. The GED match system has found a 161 centi Morgan CM match between Julie Doe and any other user so far. A person's degree of genetic relatedness can be estimated by looking at the number of centi Morgans CMs they share with one another. A very high match of 161 cm indicates a relationship no more distant than a second cousin or first cousin once removed. With some digging, maybe this relative can lead you to other immediate family members who were in on Julie's secret all along. Attempts to determine Julie's, Julie's identity will face obstacles. The most important is unearthing her birth name. The DDP and TDTF both value the release of accurate names when discussing trans and gender non-conforming people. It's unlikely that any of Julie's relatives knew her as a woman, so it adds another layer of difficulty to the task of identifying her. This is the end of this video. Make sure to give us a like and subscribe to this video. You should also share this video with your friends.